All righty. Uh, hello and welcome uh, to the session on doing it together. Uh, myself, I'm uh, Tapia Makala, a researcher here at the Salford University Creative Technology. I was in, 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 uh, invited to moderate the session. Um, this title could be very popular in high schools, um, doing it together. It doesn't actually probably mean doing it, doing IT together as much as deals oh with my. breaking technology and it works. It works. And, it works. Uh, it works. <laughs> and co well, more about social collaboration, open source, um, and, and different ways that through do-it-yourself technologies, uh, practitioners, uh, activists, local communities are starting to work uh, together. Uh, each presentation will be 20 minutes, and we will start by each presenter briefly telling about themselves and who they are. Uh, the order of speakers is that first we have Alexander Deschamps Sonsino. No, we don't. No, we don't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's right. Sorry. Alison Powell starts, then Mushan Zer Aviv, and then Alexandra uh, lasts. Correct. My old notes. <laughs> Would you like starting by introducing yourself? Sure. Thank you very much, Tapio. My name is Alison Powell. I'm a research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. And uh, as a card-carrying media scholar, I'm going to take the privilege of my position and talk a little bit about some of the um, theories that we've had about participation and citizenship and how these can be applied in an age of social media. So I'll take a little bit of a step back. Um, however, I will say that my own research practice has been deeply involved with communities and in understanding collaboration for the last 10 years or so. Um, so I am uh, certainly not separate from the actions that, uh, that are being taken in, in and around this sphere. So I'm looking forward to talking to you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Mushan Zaraviv. I'm a designer and uh, an educator. I teach um, a class called Open Source Design at Parsons uh, in New York, and that's also the title of my talk. I also teach at NYU, um, New Media Studies. And um, I'm looking specifically at participation, very inspired by the open source models, but also very suspicious about how we're slapping open source on everything, expecting it to work. So if, if you guys read the description for this session and expected to come off of this being able to, to be open sourcing everything, I'll mainly be showing you why it's hard. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I run a design studio in London called Tinker. Um, and I guess I'm going to end the session on a positive note about open source um, and talking about how that approach can actually enable the design world to change and evolve in the 21st century. Great, and uh, Alison, please start, and let's hope your laptop is still alive. <laughs> Right. So far, so good. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, no, no. I, uh, it's, it's always a bit magical when these things work. OK, except when they don't entirely work. Well, we need to get onto the correct slide first. Now we have the, the daisy wheel of death. <laughs> And as we, as we wait for the um, open source software to work, um, <laughs> we can reflect about the, the, the challenges of openness and the challenges of interoperability um, between open and closed systems. Right. Right, so just while we're waiting for this to, to turn on, this conference is about the future, and I think in an unspoken way, um, it's about a technological future. And so what I want to do in my talk today is take a bit of a step back and talk a bit about past 
and don't worry, I'll get to the present, and then we will have some tools to think a bit about the future. Um, but I'm skeptical, skeptical of presuming that the past has nothing to tell us and that we should stride forward in the expectation of perpetual progress. And I think this applies as much to the kinds of tools that we're trying to build as to our expectations about our behavior as citizens. So um, in my talk today, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about different media spheres and the way that different media spheres have configured our expectations about being a public participating and being a citizen. And specifically, I'm going to talk about um, some historical models of citizenship, their spaces and their media. And then I'm gonna talk about our contemporary social media space and the way that we operate in social media and basically what is provided to us by not the social media tools, but the entire structure of, of social media in terms of its ability to provide us with, us with, uh, with opportunities for participation. And I'm gonna talk a bit about three things that I think are significant about social media's function um, when we're thinking about participating and, uh, and acting as citizens, and these are the functions of filtering, the functions of feeds, and the functions of the funnel. Um, then, of course, because it's um, essential, I think, to uh, take a critical stance on this, I'm gonna talk a bit about the dark sides of these three functions, and finally, some opportunities to uh, address some of these drawbacks. So to start, um, it's only been since the 19th century that we've had an understanding of people outside of the elite um, as being citizens who can participate in public deliberation and in uh, setting the political agenda and responding to decisions that are being made. So the idea of the ideal public sphere was articulated very well by Habermas, and I, I promised I wasn't gonna mention Habermas in a talk, but you can't really talk about the concept of the public without talking about the idea of the um, ideal public sphere, which is the sphere outside of government and decision making where people are deliberating about important issues of the day and deciding about them and responding to them. And there are spaces and media that are very closely associated with this idea of the public sphere as the deliberative um, space of debate. And one of them is, is, of course, the cafe, and that's what Habermas used when he was describing his ideal public sphere. And the media is, of course, the newspaper. And this is a photograph from the New York Times of uh, newspaper headlines. And it, the, the emergence of the press was actually very, very important to the development of something like a public sphere. Because all of a sudden, people were aware of the decisions that elites were making, able to read comments on them and discuss them. However, the model, as you can see from this, is here are the headlines, you will read them. Here's the decisions, you will read them, you may discuss among yourselves, in the cafe perhaps, and maybe the mass media will filter those discussions back up to the elites in, who are making decisions. But essentially, it's a very sort of top-down model of decisions being made, people responding, the press um, presenting the decisions that are being made and allowing for some deliberation. So there's been lots of criticism within media studies um, of this idea of the, of the bourgeois public sphere for obvious reasons. It looks a little like an elite kind of space. It looks a little like the publics that are made within the public sphere might be quite constrained, in fact. So the next idea that we, that we have is the idea of the counterpublic, and the space of the counterpublic might be very different than the cafe, might be the street, for example, and the counterpublic is kind of pushing against um, the messages moving from the elite down to the people and actually saying, here we are, we are a counterpublic, we're going to constitute our own set of discussions, we're going to present them, and we, we, are, we are going to, uh, to operate in a, in a resistant manner we will occupy, and that is the way that we will move our message. We're gonna push against the, uh, the, the movement from the dominant public to the, from the, from the dominant decision makers to the mass public, and we're going to mobilize as a counter public. And some media spaces that we see around counter publics are alternative media, like zines. There are many other examples. Um, so this resistance uh, is a kind of occupation and a kind of pushback uh, against not only the uh, structure of, um, a of, of politics where decisions are made by an elite, but also the structure of the idealized public sphere, which is itself um, a somewhat elite space. So in terms of the evolution of media spaces and the evolution of networked media spaces, this is H.G. Wells, and I always like to put him up in some of my talks because he had this idea of the world brain 
which he thought was going to be this perfect space where everybody would have access to all knowledge and everybody could contribute knowledge. And in fact, we do have the world brain in the internet. And this provides us with another kind of public space that operates in a very different way. So we no longer have an opposition between a kind of elite decision making and then a mass public or a mobilized counter public pushing up against an elite. We have something that is much more distributed and then we have different opportunities to participate. We have something that Christopher Kelty calls argument by technology. And he argues that when we're in the network space, and particularly people with technical skills, are able to use the deliberative space of the network not just to have conversations on the network platform, but to actually use the technology itself to, uh, to create arguments about how things should be. And this will connect quite a bit with the ideas of, about open source that the other presenters will be putting forth. It's the, the idea that the technology itself can be a form of making an argument and can actually be a, be a way of, of mobilizing a public. So I've just sort of laid out three different ways of thinking about publics, thinking about participation, and thinking about media. And now I'm going to move a bit to some of the functions that I see within social media particularly. And I'm not... Say, when I say social media, I don't mean applications. I mean a whole logic of participation using media. And I think you'll see what, um, what I mean when I, when I uh, talk a bit about my models. The great thing about social media is that it's a set of functions that can work in different kinds of ways. We don't have a newspaper with the public opinion represented in the newspaper discussed without actually being connected to any sort of decision making. It's not exactly the same as having a radical zine or a radical uh, you know, alternative media center that is um, opening up to more voices without actually necessarily being able to amplify them. It's both and it's more, but it also has its own problems as a, a site for public engagement. So the three models I'm gonna talk about are the filter, the feed, and the funnel. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about the funnel because I think um, as I talk through the first two, you'll be able to quite easily come up with examples of, of how um, publics are constituted through these, these uh, different functions. So first of all, the filter. If we think about the movement from the cafe and from the street to the network, what's one of the, mo one of the most significant transformations is we've moved from information scarcity to information abundance. This is the biggest shift in our media landscape. We no longer have to wait for the headlines to come up and stand in the street and look at them. We don't have to wait for somebody else to curate our information, which is great. However, that means we have to be responsible for curating our own information. So the main way that we, that we gain uh, knowledge about what's going on in the world is by somehow filtering it. And yes, we use the mass media. And yes, I did check The Guardian this morning to find out what the news was in the UK. And then I checked The New York Times to see what the news was in, uh, in North America. And then I checked The Globe and Mail because I'm Canadian. So we still have this, some of the mass media filters. But what are the other filters? Well, I check my tw Twitter stream to see what's going on with my friends. And then I check the Twitter feed for this, for this conference to see what's going on here. So we have many different kinds of filters. And in fact, there's very good um, new research that indicates that we are using more media sources than ever before. So in fact, it's no longer a mass media situation. What, so then what, what do we do? In order to filter, then we use the feed. The feed is a very interesting kind of concept when we're, when we're thinking about the public and thinking about participation. Because I think when you're thinking logically through what is the feed, and you know, all of you are looking on your friend feeds now, I can tell, and you're, you're, and you're looking on your news feeds now, and you're thinking, okay, yes, this is, I'm, I'm perfectly in control of all of my information. But actually, I mean, I've chosen this, this image because we think of the feed as, as us pulling in, but it's, we're also being swarmed in a way by all of the, um, the opinions that we now have to filter as individuals and which our communities are filtering for us. So the feed, the, the, the friend feed in particular, is very specifically a kind of public sphere. And I would argue that it is actually more elite than the cafe because we have chosen it. We have taken ourselves and put ourselves in the middle of our, of our media environments and the, in the middle of our opportunities for public participation. And so the, the feed very much configures what kind of public we, we are active in. How many people have friends on their 
either on their Twitter accounts or in Facebook, who they absolutely vehemently disagree with. All right, we have a few who have, who, uh, who have, who have embraced disagreement, but I would, I, would, I would argue that there is a tendency for, for our own views on these issues to be amplified. So we'll get to that a, a little bit more, but I just wanted to explain the logic of the feed. And finally, the funnel, I think, is, is something that hasn't been explored quite enough in terms of understanding social media opportunities for participation. This is where individual practices can change larger structures. The difference between previous public spheres and their media and, and our contemporary one is that power coming from the top down was not necessarily met equally with the power of the resistance, although there are lots of theories of how power circulates. But now we have much easier opportunities to amplify. And I think that yesterday's discussions of open data illustrate this very well. When you have open data from the top, yes, you can use the data as citizens to, uh, to remold your actions. But as citizens, we also create lots of data. And that gets funneled. And that can be very transformative. So this is, um, I'm just going to show a few examples because I think um, in contrast to the, to the last two examples, we don't have quite as many ways of thinking about this funnel. Um, this is a project that I'm hopefully beginning very soon, waiting for funding, um, which is working with, this is um, Cycle Streets, which uses OpenStreetMap in the UK to, um, to map cycling routes. And we're working on a way of um, enabling cyclists to carry GPS-enabled mobile phones and to collect information about their cycling journeys that will then change the routes that are presented on, on Cycle Street. So this is... Um, the, in the, in the uh, top left-hand corner, the, the green um, flag is, is my house. And none of the routes that I actually cycle, and, where I, and none of the routes where people who live in my neighborhood cycle are actually represented on this map. So this is quite an, an obvious example of how you can funnel individual um, pieces of data and how that can become a form of participation. This is actually sort of a co the contrast to a lot of the open data initiatives that we've been talking about where you're opening up data that's owned by the state and, and, and asking citizens to, to do something with it. This is asking citizens to think of creating data as their own form of participation. And um, this is an, a My Society project. Many people are probably familiar with My Society and their, um, their uh, various sort of democratic tools, um, Fix My Street, reporting problems. The other one that I really like is Fill That Hole, which is another cycling-related um, reporting function. So this is data that citizens are generating, and it's funneling. So if I report a problem on Fix My Street, that information does go to my local council. Whether my local council has the ability to deal with that data is another question, and that's something that um, is very key to work on. Um, but, but there is a way in which something that I would th have thought of as very low level participation, which is just gathering data about my cycling trip, or reporting something in my back lane um, are amplified and, and, uh, and can be considered as, as potentially a form of participation using the logic of the funnel. Um, so there are other potential interesting opportunities to use the, feature, the features of the funnel. Um, I mean, I can imagine all kinds of really interesting um, things that we could work on on a local level, monitoring air and water quality using you know, very simple sensors that are plugged into mobile devices. Um, any, and, any and all things that you can think of, but it's, my point is that, there are, that the logic is actually what's transformative. It's not necessarily the applications. Once we, once we have a sense of how the logic works, then we can come, come up with the projects that use the, the, uh, the features of, um, of, of the social media landscape. Okay, so of course, we can't get too enthusiastic about this because we are critical people and this is what we do. So the first problem is the problem of the echo chamber. And this is a very long quote, and I, and, uh, and I, I will read it out. It's from uh, Evgeny Morozov, and he's, he's talking about the, the so-called Twitter revolution in Iran. The internet often makes the jump from deliberation to participation even more difficult, thwarting collective action under the heavy pressure of never-ending internal, internal debate. This is what may explain the impotence of recent protests in Iran. Thanks to the sociability and high degree of decentralization afforded by the internet, Iran's green movement has been split into so many competing debate chambers, some of them composed primarily of net savvy Iranians in the diaspora, that it couldn't collect itself 
on the eve of the 31st anniversary. So we can't collect ourselves from within our, so our, our, our echo chambers. And I think this is the major problem with the logic of participation in the social media age, and it is something that we must consider. When we think about, um, I mean, there's, there are also some, some very interesting um, statistics that have come out of the Pew uh, Internet Research Project in America saying that young people are less likely to use Twitter than adults aged 25 to 40. So look around the room at the people who are using Twitter, and we are thinking of ourselves in Twitter as being some kind of mobilized public, and we are very deliberative when we are discussing lots of things. But in fact, through the logic of the filter and the feed, we are not particularly diverse or representative, and this is, again, something to, to be very aware of. And the next, the next sort of risk is uh, the risk of being data serfs, essentially. Um, and I think that, that we, we, we have been become aware of this in terms of um, centralized, commodified social media platforms like Facebook. But we have to also understand that there's a cost and a benefit to the funnel process. So the cost, the, the, the benefit is we can, you, we can use data as a form of participation. And the, and the cost is that we are generating value for others. So we have to be careful about who we're generating value for. So what do we do to respond to this? Well, I mean, yes, we can hack things, and I think that, they, that, that, there are very, that there are many opportunities to hack things. In my research, I've spent a lot of time with people who are hacking access by using open source tools to get more access to people and to use the logic of filter, feed, and funnel in very interesting and very locally specific ways. This is um, in Montreal. People are putting Wi-Fi wi antennas on top of a, of a building, and those Wi-Fi antennas are, are being used as a community media platform. And upon that community media platform, people are getting lots of very specific local information. There's a map of... Um, of all of the hotspots in Montreal. I'm still very fond of this project, so I, I continue to talk about it. Um, one of the things that makes me very fond about it is that each of those green spots um, has a, a specific login page that, you, that every internet user passes through, whether they're on their mobile device or on their laptop, and that gives you a page with information about where you are. And that information has been used very cleverly, um, including to do some local, some site-specific art installations, but also to provide information on the local candidates, their voting records um, for the provincial elections. So that's a, that's a very interesting and innovative and hack of the sort of filter function. So you can filter in different ways, and you can use the logic of, of, uh, of social media participation in some, in some pretty commanding ways. We can also hack platforms. I'm sure people have heard of Diaspora, which is the um, NYU student project, which has um, been microfinancing to build an open social networking platform as an alternative to Facebook. Um, I think people are excited about the alternative to Facebook, and that is part of the reason why Diaspora has been successful in fundraising. They haven't coded anything yet, but I think people are quite taken by the, by, by the knowledge now that we are creating value and data for, for others. Another example of um, an, an open platform is Crabgrass, which is um, much better developed. It's been developed by Rise Up, um, and it's specifically actually for, for, uh, for social action groups. Um, the other thing we need to, to, uh, to think about and, and, uh, is, is actually infrastructure. And I know I can't do a talk without a lolcat either. It's impossible. <laughs> um, and, I, and I'll just gesture to um, you know, activism about net neutrality. Net, it, this is very contentious on the, at the top levels of governance. But again, people are quite aware of the fact that the logic of, the network, of networked participation has certain parameters that... Um, that can be very constraining. And so finally, I want to, um, I want to argue for, for, for transforming practices. And this is a photograph I, I took in Cairo. And it's public participation of the, like, the most obvious and, and visceral variety. Um, the, the local football team won. And we were all in the street dancing. That's a city bus that people are on top of. And there's some interesting things happening. So, the other thing we have to be aware of when we're talking about participation, when we're talking about citizenship, is that there are lots of kinds of participation, and we have to find a way to not just 
occupy our echo chambers and believe that we are acting transformatively because we are deliberating with each other and because we are feeling as if we are a public sphere, because the, because the, the structures of participation are bigger than us and people are going to want to participate in different ways, which is another reason why, yes, I think it's very important to open up the platforms, but we also need to acknowledge that people use platforms in their everyday lives because they are convenient and because they are mass media in their own way, and we should not um, you know, be, be, be sniffy and snobbish about people who are using Facebook because Facebook has network effects at the moment that make it more valuable to more people. So we, we do still have to think of participation in a broad sense. And finally, we have to think about the constraining structures we're still enrolled in. In the UK, we have had some very interesting results um, in, our, in the elections, but it remains that we, are, that we are still within a system of representative democracy. So onwards, lots of things to think about, hopefully lots of things that my fellow panelists can address, and um, certainly come and find me in the echo chamber if you so desire. Thank you very much. Uh, no, you, you, I muted it. Are you? Um, there used to be a different adapter here. The theme of the uh, echo chamber reminded me of an event uh, hosted by a virtual platform in Amsterdam that dealt with walled gardens and raised the question of to which degree, in a way, the logic of openness is, uh, is paramount to collaboration online, or whether, in fact, sometimes degrees of openness actually can be also a risk a limitation, so whether the logic of openness is somehow li uh, liberatory or not, and also kind of discussions on the... Uh, sort of new feudal orders of who owns your turf mm -hmm. in these walled gardens is a very relevant topic to address. Are you all uh, well connected with the screen? I am. Looks good up there. Does Bingo. sound? Can I get sound? Oh, actually, I, I might have turned that off, so. In January, too. Okay, yes, we do have sound. Okay, so um, just before I start, I, I want to give you some context in, um, about this book, which a video would explain even more than I would. In January 2010, seven people met in Berlin to write a book about collaboration called Collaborative Futures. The project was run by Floss Manuals and sponsored by the Transmediala Festival. It was an experiment and we were not sure it could be done. We began with two words, the title, Collaborative Futures. We started out by introducing each other and doing a lot of brainstorming. And we wrote a lot of notes and put them on the board. We organized them, and then we wrote. And then we edited, and then we wrote some more. We were joined by some collaborators. We worked all day for five days. At the end, we finished the book. 33,000 words. It is, of course, a perpetual work in progress. It is available at www.bookie.cc slash collaborative futures and a print version is available from the flossmanuals.net website. So um, we're, th this happened in January and actually next month we're going to continue writing this, uh, this book. Um, so, okay, so I want to talk about um, open source design that also informed some of the ideas in the book and is informed by some of the other ideas in the book. Um, I've been teaching a, a class at Parsons. I'll, I'll just give you, you know, so, some 
credits for the for the affiliation. So, uh, shiftspace.org is my open source project that uh, deals a lot with uh, with interface and design, and I'll I'll speak briefly about that later. Um, I'm an honorary resident at IBEAM, uh, an art and technology center in uh, New York. I uh, and as I teach, uh, I teach at NYU and at Parsons. So. I've been teaching this class called Open Source Design at Parsons, and when, when I started teaching it, I was like, I love open source, it's working for me in, in this other project, and there's not enough designers involved in open source, I'll just make a class and the students would make open so design for open source projects. That's it, simple idea, why shouldn't it work? Um, so so the, this idea of, um, of open source is so exciting, let's, let, let's try to migrate it to other, other environments. And, and you know, you hear a lot about open source democracy and open source ar architecture and open source uh, filmmaking and so many fields, but when you look at it, open source works very well in code, it works very well in Wikipedia when you, when you get to uh, making an encyclopedia. Um, but even in the field of networked software, which is web design, you, you don't have uh, the, these amazing, um, the, this amazing um, inspiring collaboration that you see with code. So I would say, uh, just for the sake of the, um, of the research, if open source should work anywhere beyond code and, and Wikipedia, First, it should be web design. So I'm, I'm looking at web design as kind of the first step. If we get things right about web design, we can move on to democracy uh, and so on. And I'm very interested in moving on to democracy and so on. Um, so um, I, I want to talk a, a bit about collaboration. So if, if I'm over there in yellow and my goal is over there in green, and I know exactly how to get there, it just you know, I can walk straight forward to, to that point. There's no reason for me to collaborate, and that's fine. Because it's just, I can do it myself, and uh, you know, our panel is, the, is called Doing It Together, based on, the, on Do It Yourself. This is Do It Yourself. But, in a lot of cases, it looks more like this, and then I don't know exactly where I'm going, I'm going to run into some problems until I get to the point. Now, the good news and the bad news but let's be positive, is that there's a lot of people like me. Um, so each person coming from a different uh, place and trying to get to a different place, and it's important to understand they're trying to get to a different place. Um, so all of us are confused on the way, but look, there's a point where all of us might meet, and, and let's do that, let's meet over there, and actually let's, let's document the way to get there so it's easier to get there, because we are all going to meet there. And from there, we can possibly uh, continue to gather towards our goal. We want to reach uh, our goal, our, all of our goals together. It's, at some point, we'll just fork, and, and then we'll reach uh, each of our goals. So we have the merge and the fork. We, we, have, we have these two points of, um, of um, coming together and sep separating. And basically, this is where collaboration happens. Um, and it's important to understand that, that these two points are constantly, constantly happening in open source. Um, so, to, to speak about some, some of, the, of the processes that happen within the, the open source uh, process. So first of all, um, the first re reason a developer would do something is to sc scratch an itch. So we have this obvious uh, m motivation. I'm, I'm writing this code. Why shouldn't I put it online? You know, show people what I'm working on. Show, you know, if they have some suggestion for me, that, that's easy. And maybe they, they would co collaborate with me. So, so the cost for collaboration or, or even setting the ground for collaboration is really low. But when you're talking about open source design motivation, there's not as much um, straightforward um, motivation there. Um, it's not as easy as just a po posting code online uh, out of context. Um, and we also have a chicken and egg pro problem. Designers don't use open source software, and then open source software don't become better, and then designers don't use open source software because it's not better, and you need to interject the, the, this uh, circle at some point, but, but how? 
Um, the second issue is granularity, and that's kind of one of the main things that make open source code work is the, the fact that it has a very, very uh, granular and small building block, which is the character. That is true all, about coding and, and about writing in the case of Wikipedia. So what are we getting from, from this character? We're getting a varied level, a ladder of a contribution. For example, um, I can contribute one typo to a Wikipedia article, and I can contribute a whole set of articles. And each of these are contributions, and it's re it really helps me to start with a typo, continue to, to switching to a, a, a word, adding a reference and so on, and, and, and then people can, can choose their collaboration and involvement in their own pace. This is very important. It also gives us history to show exactly what the, everybody did. It, it gives us easy moderation. It's actually not fun to try to vandalize Wikipedia because it's really easy to work on something for a long time and then somebody uh, switches it like that and it gives you transparency. All of that are enabled by, by the granular piece of the, of the character. The third thing is, uh, is about language. I'm referring a lot to this um, um, article by, by Stuart Hall called, called Encoding and Decoding. And uh, Stuart Hall talks about um, the communication cycle as being not only about um, I'm saying something, you hear me, you say something. There's actually a creative uh, process uh, in encoding. So I have a framework of knowledge, and in the case of speech, I would formulate that, I would encode that into, into words, and then I will pronounce them with my funny accent. Um, and and, and you, 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 we have a mutual language. I could have spoken to you in Hebrew right now. You wouldn't have understood me, so I went for English. Um, and then there's the, there's the process of decoding, which is also a creative process. Uh, creative process, we're all about uh, celebrating uh, creativity, but uh, creative process also uh, um, g g gives us some challenges for uh, collaboration. So, so the, the process in which you hear, hear what I say and interpret that, that's a creative process as well, and, and each one of you is getting something different from what I'm saying. Um, when, when we're taking that model that, that Stuart Hall uh, proposed, and we're thinking about it in the case of programming, um, when, when I'm writing code, I'm actually using the, the, the same code for encoding that, that the software w would be using t for decoding. So if I, if I write something that the software doesn't expect, I get an error. Um, and then my code wouldn't execute. And, and you know what? It would also tell me that it wouldn't execute because I, I would automatically see that error. So we have to be communicating uh, using the same encoding and decoding, which is very, very different than the kind of communication that we have be between people. Um, what, what it gives me is uh, using the same code for uh, speaking with my computer um, and then for, for speaking with, uh, with uh, possibly some centralized repository and from there um, other people that, that can collaborate using the same code um, and the same language to, to create um, collaboration. Um, so we have, a, a, in encoding, we have, um, when we're thinking about encoding with design, fi finding a language is the first step in design, a graphic language, that uh, col colors, layouts, animation, interaction, if we're talking about uh, our example of web design. Um, so think about it, it's basically, it, it, the, the process is like starting to code um, to collaborate on code without deciding, uh, deciding what, uh, what programming language to choose. So if we, if we would have tried to, to do that, we would have never managed to collaborate. Um, so we, we, need, we need to be setting uh, collaboration standards. And the, these collaboration standards, uh, as, we, as we described, they are part of the, cre of the creative process. So, so, so the, the, it really changes that process. Uh, think about try, trying to, uh, it's every project that you start, you also uh, program the programming language as a part of the project. Um, and then when we, you're talk, we're talking about standards, standards and innovation are, are at odds. And we have to understand that. As much as we want standards so we can collaborate, um, we also want innovation, which is the opposite of standards. It's, it's standing uh, outside and, and, uh, and trying things out. Um, 
and we're talking, when we're talking about decoding with design, as, as I said, code, code does, uh, either executes or not. If one of you is, is uh, not understanding what I'm saying at all, I don't see a little X above your heads. And I would have loved to see an X above your heads, and, and then I would have repeated that, that thing. I, to, I told that to my students uh, um, w when I was talking about the, that with them, and, and then I, 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 I actually said, except with the case of Miriam. Miriam does like, like that. <laughs> And then, and then I know I need to <laughs> repeat what I was saying. Um, so there are ex exceptions there, uh, but usually not much. Um, so computers multitask, so they can interpret that, interpret that. If uh, somebody is writing a, a messy code and somebody's writing um, a, a nicely form formulated code, but both of them uh, respond to what the, the language expects, it, it would process that. We don't. And I know we're all multitasking, and I'm multitasking as well. Multitasking is just having a short uh, attention span. That, that, that's actual multitasking. Our brains don't multitask, especially if you're men. Um, and if we speak about Wikipedia, again, a, a very a viable example for non-programming open source project, um, it, it has largely rational guidelines. And these l l rational guidelines help collaboration. You can't have poetry on Wikipedia. My students try to, to uh, write their own uh, f first uh, Wikipedia uh, um, contributions, and every time they tried to be creative, it was like <laughs> um, And, and that, that's what allows uh, Wikipedia to work. So did I come to uh, convince you that it can't be done? Uh, I wouldn't be wasting your time or trying to uh, disappoint you like that, especially with the title of our, of our uh, panel. So I want to give you a couple of examples where I think it's, it is happening. Um, so we, we're seeing um, sharing of resources. And in a lot of cases, when people are talking about open source design, they're talking about putting their stuff online and allowing other people to use them. And indeed, uh, as, as we're also talking about, uh, about it in the Collaborative Futures book, uh, sharing is the first step towards collaboration. But it's only the first step. It's not the whole step. Um, so when we're talking about open culture, open culture is about opening up. Open software is about collaboration. That's not the same thing. So yes, we are doing, uh, starting to do this, uh, these first steps there. WordPress is a very interesting example. WordPress the, uh, be, being in, um, uh, the, op the most popular open source um, blogging software, and, and by that also the most popular uh, uh, blogging software in general, um, it has, um, in, in version 2.5, they have actually hired um, one of the highest end uh, web design companies, HappyCog, to redesign the admin area. Um, and HappyCog did a great job, but I must say that uh, in 2.7, the WordPress team did a much better job continuing from that same language and same approach that, that was introduced by Happy Cog. And, and they didn't stop at that. Uh, they, they actually, the first step of, uh, of the WordPress community towards involving more uh, design contribution was with this blog post uh, from a year and a half ago uh, titled, uh, Calling All WordPress, uh, all, all WordPress, lo loving, uh, WordPress Loving Icon Designers. And I saw that, um, that post while we were going through the, the semester of the open source design class, and I was like, perfect, we're, we're using WordPress in this class, let's try to see, maybe we'll uh, m make some icons for uh, WordPress. And we indeed, the whole class collaborated on, on making icons for WordPress, and, and we submitted them. Um, we have a, all of the problems that, were, that I mentioned uh, earlier, a lot, of them came, uh, a lot of the insights about them came from that process. Um, because inconsistency was our number one um, problem there. Uh, but yet, we have uh, submitted them, and, and I was very inspired to see the way uh, the WordPress uh, team has, has tried to assess uh, the, the results. So, so you would uh, imagine they, that they would have some questionnaire, which, which icon said you would like the most. But what I was really inspired by is, the, is this part of the questionnaire. For example, asking uh, detailed questions about the metaphors. So for example, what do you think would be a good metaphor for appearance? Paintbrush, chameleon, open eye, and so on. 
And that's basically how we knew that our nice little chameleon is actually probably not the most uh, intuitive um, choice for, for an appearance icon. Um, and, and these are the icons that were chosen. And, and what I found to, to be really great is that in our discussion in the class, and my students said, these icons are much better than us. I'm voting for this. Because it wasn't about getting my word out there. It's like the goal was getting better icons for, for, for the WordPress admin. And if that, that's the right solution, then that's what we should go for. Except, four sure. Um, except one student who was like, hey, guys, you should vote for us. Um, so we, we're seeing other examples. So if, you, if we're talking about graphic design, um, on, on, the, um, on the top left, we, ha we have this, the, the Joseph Muller uh, Brookman book, uh, Grid Systems which is kind of a very important uh, graphic design uh, um, source. But that inspired blog posts that then ins inspired uh, um, grid-based uh, frameworks uh, using CSS, and which inspired many other uh, um, grid, uh, grid systems. Or, or we, we have inter interaction uh, design elements, for, like the model uh, box or the light box. You have thousands of them. This is open source design. The, the, this is collaboration on design, um, uh, on interaction design. Um, you have um, best practices through, through um, um, uh, you know, best practices for typography, for example. That, that's happening on blogs. That's a, that's a part of, of research that is, that is open. And you, you, you're asking yourself, what, what, what is Apple doing here? But Apple did give some inspiration to then have other, um, other systems um, that, that try to cre create some standardization uh, that people can collaborate on. And uh, lastly, the project that I won't be talking about too much today, uh, ShiftSpace. Um, ShiftSpace, we call it an open source layer above any website, and we're trying to move beyond user-generated content to also user-generated interfaces. Um, so that, that can be another step in, in collaboration between users and, and sites. Um, so fixing it. If we're talking about, a, about scratching an itch, price is always itching, but it's not enough. Um, and we can't ex expect or force users uh, to use bad tools, even though they're open source. That's, that wouldn't be the, the way, in my view, and it wouldn't even be good for open source, because that's not a way to, to achieve something better. Um, and we are seeing uh, some success in web design, as I mentioned, but it's still very code-based. So if we're talking about the granularity, when it's possible, definitely use code, because of, of all the things that it comes with. Um, so definitely get designers on version control systems, and all of my, my students are on Git. So, and on GitHub. So, so that's possible. It can be done, and one of my students even wrote a, a tutorial Git for designers. Um, um, put all master files online, so use things like Dropbox to, to collaborate. They, these things can be, can be done. Um, about la language, if we, we can try to think about collaborative encoding. So we can conduct net networked research. We have the tools for that, namely blogs. Um, we, we can think of extensible languages. So in CSS, for example, you, you, have, you can extend one style from another style, and you can create the, the special case while, while still um, getting the benefit of the general. Um, the th third thing is the document. Document your, your, your design. You have that in design even before the web. Style guides were all about uh, and are all about uh, documenting the design. Um, collaborative decoding is also possible. So we're seeing, and some of the design decisions are rational and therefore cannot be, can be agreed upon, like uh, user experience research, technical aspects, and best practices. And again, blogs are, are the way to document that, and that's a part of the open source process. Um, so I, I, think, I think the subject gets to the point of scaling subjectivity. I've been very interested in this idea of scaling subjectivity. Can, can uh, subjectivity even scale, or would that not be subjectivity at all? And we, we have these two examples of, of a, a design for a mouse, in this case, industrial design. On one hand, the, the magic mouse by Apple, like this is the way you would do things, and we have the leadership, we, we know how to do it right and just use our products. Um, on the other hand, 
we don't know how to do things, the open office mouse, but there's tons of ways of doing it. So you can program all of these thousand buttons that, that we have and try to think of all the, of the combina combinations that you can have there. That's uh, very open, but again, not, not the way. So if, if, we're, if we're trying to, to think of what, what is actually happening in, in open source, people come and go, become more involved, less involved, new leaders are, are, are emerging. That, that's, these are things that happened in, in our project as well. So a more nuanced uh, analysis of open source would be a combination of openness and leadership. So take the openness on one hand, take the leadership uh, in the other hand and try to move forward with that and we definitely need that in design. So finally, we cannot just sprinkle open source on everything um, and design, collaboration is hard, but uh, let's make it easier and let's experiment more. And to put my, uh, my, the money where my mouth is or whatever, um, this presentation was not uh, using a Keynote it wasn't even using open office, it's all HTML and CSS, and it's on GitHub, and I would love for you to go and fork this presentation and, and give me uh, some feedback. And you can follow me on at Mushon or uh, ask me questions later. Thank you very much. I have some books as well. Does anybody have any specific questions to this presentation? Yes. There you go. I was just very interested in the last point there about um, scaling subjectivity. Um, it seems to me that might be about excellence. That, that, that might be about excellence in terms of scaling Well, uh, well, de de definitely, and you know, the more I was thinking about scaling subjectivity, I was like, oh, th this is something that has been dealt with forever, and and I think uh, the the previous presentation was uh, was talking about that specifically, like when when you are deciding this is what everybody needs to use, or it, th this is, is what everybody would understand, uh, th this is trying to. Um, to mitigate the, the tension between um, this is good for a lot of people, but everybody's different. So sca scaling subjectivity is bound to fail forever because, because, it, it, because it's a paradox. But, but at the same time, if we can try to, to, uh, to understand where, do we, where, where we can agree and, and when we, where we are, um, different, and then at the same time also leave the option for, uh, as I showed in my, in my diagram, leave the option of forking to, to reach that, that those specific subjective goals, that's where we have the opportunity to get the best both from uh, the objective uh, um, needs that collaboration requires and from the subjective needs that then can be, can be achieved uh, individually or in small groups. One yeah. more. Well, I'm completely against that. Um, the, and, and, you know, there's not a, a more horrible moment than the the, the Steve Jobs presentation uh, unveiling the the Apple um, the, the iPhone a couple of years ago. Um, he was going like, and you know what? We have 20 patents in there, and the crowd goes, yay! And they're like, what? What are you clapping about? They just said that they're going to hold all of, all of the market and not allow anybody else to to. Uh, to, to move forward with, with, with the kind of innovation that they're showing us here. Uh, so yeah, th there's definitely this tension. Um, and, and a part of what I'm trying to say, we need to do a better job of providing alternatives to Apple, providing alternatives for a very, very strong leadership that, that is a good leadership. Good leadership in the sense that, 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 that is, um, it's, gi it's giving people what they want, uh, or, or at least they, what the people think they want. 
and, and, and it's doing a very good job of scaling subjectivity, but it, do, it, it does have its weak points that I mentioned, and, and I think if we understand the challenges that, that, that we have for open source design, then we can challenge uh, bodies li like, uh, like Apple in, in the game of uh, interaction design and scaling subjectivity. Thank you, Mushan. And now, next. <laughs> Alexander is setting up, and uh, I was actually nicely reminded of uh, Claude Shannon's mathematical theory of communication of 1948, where he launched the sort of a sender-receiver model of communication, which was based on a telephone switch, a mechanical structure. And in his book, he wrote a warning of, please don't you know, ever, ever use this on anything human. It's only for machines. Uh, so this kind of like um, contradiction between sort of engineering worldview and sort of more interpretative uh, ways of working with technology, I think it's a very good point that you raised. How are we doing with the... Uh... Set up, can I help? No, it's fine. Cool. But we can uh, sort of come back to encoding and decoding questions later. It was actually the Stuart Hall's essay in 1980, which was like about 20, uh, quite a lot later from uh, 1940. It was, was the first essay that kind of really strongly challenged this kind of uh, very mechanical idea of communication. Ta -da. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm also really happy to be in good company. Um, and to be able to hopefully, if my slides ever show up, um, bring a different perspective. Okay, so uh, my name is Alexandra and I run a design studio in London called Tinker. I'm going to talk about uh, mostly actually stuff that interests me right now um, and hopefully new things that you haven't heard about and uh, bring in a perspective that's much more from the open source hardware um, conversation. Um, so I think at the moment what's really, really exciting is that the design landscape is changing. Working as a designer, studying as a designer is really, really very different from when I studied as a designer, which was from you know, 99 to 2003, and I did product design. And at the time, what it meant to do product design was a very specific set of uh, considerations. This is an example of something I uh, designed when I was a student. It's terrible. Um, don't you know, hold it against me. But um, it was a perfect example of where technology lied when uh, we were doing device design. So it was all about how it looked and very little about how it was actually made. Uh, when I was asking, for my presentation, you know, should I show where stuff is? And you know, what about a printed circuit board? Because I'm pretty sure there are some in you know, remote controls because this was a remote control de design. They're like, oh, just draw a box and put technology in it. <laughs> um, which I kind of thought like, oh, okay, well, this is not very compelling because I'm not learning more and I'm certainly, you know, I'm in product design class and course and I'm not having a conversation with someone who knows because you know, my teachers know and my peers know and, uh, you know, I'm kind of stuck in this knowledge box or these limitations. So I thought, you know, that's a bit shit. Um, and then, so I moved on to do a master's in interaction design, uh, which is where uh, I suddenly, it was all about the technology, and it was all about the knowledge that I could gain. Uh, at the time I was a student, the Arduino uh, board was being developed. Who here knows what Arduino is? Getting better, that's good. Every time I do a talk, I ask that question just in case. Um, for those of you who don't, I'm gonna show my favorite video about Arduino. If it works. Welcome to ye old awesome electronics workshop. You better like this or you better... Well, you know, walk of mine. I'm Bree Pettis. I'm Joe Grand. And we get together every once in a while and make some awesome electronics. We get to build really cool stuff and show you how to do it. It's called the Awesome Electronics Workshop. Yay! So what do we have for you today? Today we're getting back to basics. We're going to introduce you to a new platform called Arduino. Arduino? Yeah, Arduino. Arr! 
Arduino. Arduino? The Arduino is an open source hardware and software platform based around the Atmel AVR AT Mega 168 microprocessor. It's a great low cost platform and because it's open source there's a huge community of people who are using it and developing for it and making up new projects for it. So there's all sorts of stuff that you can learn about online. I couldn't really do a better job than Brie. Uh, it was also Talk Like a Pirate Day when they did the video, which would explain that bit of it. Um, so uh, when I was a student, it was being developed, and it was something that we started using in projects. And when we started the company, we thought, OK, what better way to explain what physical computing interaction design is, et cetera, than to use those kinds of platforms and get people to use them. So um, it kind of escalated massively from then on. The platform was developed in 2005. That video is from 2007 from Make Magazine. and. Uh, Brie, who's now developed the MakerBot. And so it went from kind of design students and hackers and designers being interested to anywhere from um, sort of new media students, graphic design students, architecture students, uh, to the advertising industry, which is now using it to do all sorts of funky stuff and all sorts of uh, interesting projects, to uh, R&D departments, who kind of see it as a low-cost way of doing interesting development. So it went from you know, very, very niche uh, project to something that people kind of have wrapped their heads around, even conceptually, even if they've never owned one, they've never really necessarily played around with one, they kind of know about it, um, which I think is, is pretty great. Um, again, sort of, you know, okay, fine, open source hardware, what on earth does this mean? And for me right now, the big questions are, how can this make us, um, change the way in which we do research, we do product development, we kind of think about the world of design. So, you know, a project from ITP from a few years ago is Kickby, which is a belt that you put on your wife's stomach when she's pregnant, and uh, whenever the baby kicks, it sends out a tweet to a private account. You know, not sure I would wear it, but um, interesting. Um, catalog, which is uh, a set of tools around Arduino that allows you to kind of track your cats. So in this case, Bobbin is out and Tuffin is in. Um, these are all projects that are online that you can uh, pretty much, some of them are uh, online, there are kits, et cetera. Others, it's just a piece of code. Others, it's actually a product that they're trying to patent. Um, Botanicals is a project also formerly from ITP, uh, which is a little kit that you put in your plants, and whenever your plants are too dry, it would either send you a text message or a tweet on the fact that you need to water your plants. So if you travel quite a lot, that's quite a, kind of useful. Um, and now more and more, of course, the energy conversation is very much at the forefront of people's minds. So uh, the current cost meter is a device that was given out in the UK by Scottish Energy, and uh, the people immediately hooked up to Arduino in order to do visualization of their energy consumption, being able to kind of play around with that data uh, and show that data. Um, and also, if you don't necessarily want the interface of having lots of numbers on a, um, uh, on a little screen in a box, then maybe you want an ambient orb. So uh, Nick O'Leary, who works at IBM, developed an ambient orb that connected to the current cost meter. So you would have this orb that glowed different colors depending on how your energy consumption was going. So ambient information, ambient... Uh, um, all those kinds of devices. And then you have uh, something like Bublino, which was, uh, is basically the, you know, the nicest thing you could have in a conference, uh, which is a little bubble machine that when the hashtag of the conference gets mentioned, the bubbles just blow. Um, so super sweet project uh, by Adrian McEwen, who lives in Liverpool. And uh, you know, a really great way to engage the physical with the virtual um, and all those things. So for me, it's uh, open source is very much there to empower people to develop new solutions, uh, to scratch the itch that they have that no one else has, because there doesn't necessarily need to be a mass market product available for them to be able to do that. Uh, and there probably shouldn't be. Um, openness is very much in the world of hardware, is very much about kind of information. And knowledge is power, and if you know what lies 
behind the devices that you own, then you can do something about them. You can hack them. You can change them. You can call the company and go, I have a better idea. Uh, all that is really, really good. And, you know, in the context of the examples that I just gave, uh, what we started thinking about is, okay, well, you know, open source also means that uh, if people are developing their own products, that they have the better solution to their own problems. And where is a good context to kind of do some research around that and, and expose some of the possibilities around that? And it quickly became the home. Uh, because one of the things that has failed, you know, enormously in the market is smart homes. Uh, any smart home idea is usually really boring, really uh, inadequate. Uh, the scenarios are just, you know, stuff I wouldn't want and no one I know would want. And the home is a really strange space. It's highly personal. It's also this kind of black box in terms of technology. Some people love to have technology at home. Some people hate to have technology at home. I kind of play around with technology all day in the office, so at home I have a radio. I don't even have a TV. Uh, but I do have my laptop. So, you know, what are the ways in which uh, the home can become a playground for technology, a playground for experimentation, but not coming in and going, hi, I'm a designer, and I think that I will, you know, get you to use technology in the right ways. But, you know, hi, here's a set of tools. Do you want to, you know, do you fancy playing around with them and see if there are things that you'd like to explore that are totally unique to you, won't scale up, probably, might even fail. Um, but, you know, let's try this out. Because, you know, one apartment, this is a, a series of uh, photographies, this is a photographer who went to a very large building, um, one of the kind of Trellick Tower-like buildings in London, and took pictures of everybody's flats because all the infrastructure of the flat is the same, but the personalization around the flats are completely different uh, because people's homes are like that. You know, you can think of cities in terms of grand infrastructures that you can design with, but the home is, totally different space. Um, so we decided, OK, well, you know, what's a, what's a good way to do that? What's a good context to do that in? And you can only really do it in an open way. You can only really allow people to use open tools and be completely transparent about the context in which you're going to be trying to get them to use stuff. Um, and you know, not being a necessarily an academic myself, uh, and you know, I stopped at my master's because I couldn't even possibly imagine doing anything like a PhD, um, just because I get bored really easily. Um, I thought, you know, okay, well, let's do research in a totally different way, in ways in which academia doesn't even know how to understand. Um, and let's investigate differently as well. Let's use ways in which, you know, it's not ethnography, it's kind of ethnography 2.0. Let's use Twitter, let's use blogging, let's use video. Let's use all the tools that people are actually comfortable using already. Let's not try to uh, overthink this too much. And let's try to communicate and connect with communities in a totally different way, which is why, you know, then we decided, okay, well, you know, let's just do this. Let's just try this out. So um, we launched it last week. It's called HomeSense, um, so homesenseproject.com. And uh, basically, we're inviting anybody who's interested, who's in uh, the UK, France, and in Italy, who wants, you know, who knows a grandmother or like a family that has zero background in technology, but is just interested in exploring what they could do within their home and having that conversation. And having people also in those spaces who are super enthusiastic about Arduino, super enthusiastic about tools and, and design and, and open design. And get those people together and get them to use the latest gear and the latest you know, cool stuff and see what happens. Get them to blog about it, get them to post up videos about it and, you know, see what actually people would want to use. Because maybe you'll find out that actually, you know, all the smartness that you'd want is more or less in the living room and the kitchen, but maybe a little bit, you know, in the corridors, or maybe lighting's not really interesting, it's not really where it's at, but it's about tracking your kids or your cat or, you know, the TV or the fridge. Uh, 
all that kind of stuff is totally open in this particular context. Um, you know, what's the, what's the future smart home? And maybe there's nothing there to begin with. Maybe that whole idea is a total failure, but at least I think this way in which we're looking at it is uh, a smarter way to do it. Um, you know, what if people design their own solutions? Maybe they, you know, there probably won't be a mass market product out of this at all. And that's okay, because those six households across Europe will have like really fun stuff at home. And that'll be conversation starters for like the Sunday lunch, you know, with the family. Um, and the outcome is totally unknown and very open. So if there's stuff that fails, that's also going to be open, that's also going to be documented. And it, that's as open and as transparent and as iterative and as creative a process as you can actually develop. And that for me, you know, having come from product design, traditional industry, et cetera, that is what it means to be a designer in the 21st century. Um, we're also, I'm nodding to my friends in the audience, um, at Highwire in Lancaster University, who uh, you know are trying to kind of extend that thinking into research, into academia. What does it mean to be a center for research? And they're going to try to work with us on Home Sense, and I'm really, really happy for that. Um, we also, you know, wonderfully enough, convinced EDF to work with us on that. EDF, massive big company with massive big R&D budgets that have like a campus for R&D, who usually only work in black box, IP, et cetera, environments, we're like, you know, do you, do you want to play around with this? Because obviously some of the stuff we're going to find out is going to be around energy consumption. And they're like, yeah, sure. So everything is, you know, they're going to help us find people in France because they're kind of there. And uh, everything is documented online, and they're happy with that which again pushes the boundaries of what it means to be a designer, what it means to work with corporate environments uh, and corporations, uh, because some of them are actually quite keen to work in open ways. Um, so for me, there's a, you know, there's a really interesting space that's being created right now with those, uh, with those new tools, with those new approaches, and I would like to think that eventually the infrastructures that we build for ourselves, academic, uh, the education infrastructures, the R&D infrastructures, can start to be affected by that thinking and start kind of growing their own ecologies and growing their new open ways. Because IP will always be something people will want to hold on to, um, whether we like it or not. You know, wonderful, lovely, shiny products like Apple uh, do well because we like them. Uh, you know, they're not open and you can kind of bang that drum a lot, but uh, people still want to buy them because they're desirable. If we start creating desirable services, products, infrastructures that are open and that are as desirable, then change can operate. And I really hope that, you know, you get involved in this. If you're interested, if you know a grandmother somewhere who would benefit from this, you know, give me a call or email me. Thank you. Direct questions to her right now? Shall we just open it up for? Uh, can you um, give some uh, examples of how uh, people in these other domains outside of DIY, kind of hacking domains, are using Arduinos? You, you kind of listed a bunch of fields there. Yeah, um, I mean, just in terms of development work, uh, so. Uh, the NASA used Arduino, uh, the, the space agency used Arduino for prototyping uh, their latest uh, thing. Um, if, you, if you Google Arduino, NASA, there's something there. I, I can never remember examples. Uh, Nike's latest ad, uh, which was a sort of turntable take on the shoe, so you used the shoe to make noise and to make sound, which was an ad that was highly produced, use Arduino in it. And the designer who, uh, who did the, all the technology around the ad also blogged about it and blogged about the use of it in there. Um, da, 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 da. 
I mean, I can think of tons of examples. It's really, um, you know, I'll, I'll post up a blog post and post up all the company, you know, the, the um, corporate examples I can think of. Sure. Wait. Yeah. 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 To add to that, the Guardian, they're hiring an Arduino programmer. Uh, the problem is... I don't know what to do. <laughs> no, well, the, the interesting thing is uh, there was a confusion on Twitter around that because it's actually an ad in Guardian Jobs. So it's not an ad for, That's it's not problem. Guardian hiring. It's, uh, it's someone who just posted an ad. But the fact that there is now Arduino knowledge is part of something that you want to hire for is, is great. I think it's fabulous. Anybody else? I guess I would have one. There you go. You're in the shadows. I know. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of design and Dita Rams and Braun and product design. I'm a big fan of online social networking. Um, and I work in the communications uh, business myself. I have a problem with um, the design of online social networks themselves and in terms of their beauty and their aesthetic quality, etc. Do you... Um, have or know of any examples where design and online social network is working beautifully in the cultural or corporate sector? Would you like to define beautifully before we go yeah. into the... I think I, 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 the, the definition of beauty being um, graphically lovely and um, <laughs> typographically lovely. <laughs> Well, well, I think I think there are a, a lot of uh, examples for that, and and you know, with a, I, I think your point is coming back to the to this idea of subjectivity, and and you you are you're saying I'm looking at Facebook and this doesn't look nice to me, um, and I think what they're trying to do is to make sure that it would be bearable enough for enough people rather than cater specifically to you. And, and if you compare that, for example, to MySpace, um, my, MySpace was, uh, was giving um, individual authors um, as, much, um, uh, as much freedom as possible, which made it chaotic. Chaotic and beautiful uh, in its chaos. But, but, but if you look, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm going for the three big ones. If you, if you look at Twitter, you have, I think you have kind of a balance between, between the two, because you choose your background and you choose your colors, but, but still the layout is exactly the same. So even people who are not really into that animated GIF that you put in the background are, are, are visiting your Twitter page, they can, still, um, they can still decipher what you're trying to say. So no, Ma <clears throat> no McDonald's design offices for social media. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, j j just the, the, and I gave three proprietary examples. Um, we are seeing more attempts to, in, as we said, open source um, social networking. I think, I think um, there are a bunch of examples and WordPress specifically, I think right now is the best, uh, the best option for that with WordPress 3.0 coming every day now, um, you would be able to quite in, in less than 10 minutes install a social network and then use the variety of, uh, of themes and it gives both subjectivity and, uh, and networking. Thanks. Any further questions from the audience? Any hands up? No? Maybe. I have, uh, I have any questions question. to each other? I have one, but I'm saving that to the last because no, we might be running out of time. So take turns. Okay, please. you should go first because I need to formulate my. And uh, should we be out of here by one or? Okay, so we've taken like maximum ten minutes and then close. Okay. Sure. Now I'm formulating my question. Um, I mean, I, I have a, I've, I sort of articulated a very broad sense of, of participation, and um, what I'm interested in is, is both of your comments on the connection between participation in the sense of participating in things that are um, outside of ourselves, so political, political or collective, and the kinds of maybe more, you know, 
constrained discussions about design and, um, you know, and code. And so trying to draw the connection between code and collaboration and participation. And if you have, either of you have comments on that, it would be very interesting. We might have to have a beer afterwards. <laughs> More than one. Um, but I, th I think, I think it comes down to this concept of ladders of participation. There, there, there are uh, different steps, and I think uh, Clay Shirky wrote about it in his book, um, and he, he's talking about uh, the first step being sharing, the second one being um, uh, collaboration slash, slash discussion, um, or discussion and then collaboration, then the, th the third being the desirable collective action as being in the political beyond, beyond, beyond the, the, the specific project. I know, I know you have a problem with that. Um, um, I, I, think, I, I think it's um, it, it, it is a matter of, uh, of, of, of taking that step, uh, how, however you define uh, that ladder, and, and, and moving from one, one, uh, one to the other because um, we have to understand that, that the complexity of collaboration is, and trying to reach that level of collaboration is, it is desirable, but at the same time, it, it, it bears a very high uh, step. And, and if, you, if you get the opportunity of, uh, of having really, really low costs for collaboration, and I think that's, that's what I so uh, admire about uh, version control systems like Git, that I, I'm not about collaborating. I mean, I'm not trying to collaborate. I'm just putting my code online. You can do whatever you want with it. If you want to collaborate on that, just copy my code, do whatever you want. I'll, I'll actually check out what you've done. And then we, we, we might collaborate in the future. Rather than setting up like, now we're setting a collaboration, you have to ask permission. Even if the code is online, if you want to collaborate with me, I need to accept your collaboration. All, all, all of these costs, added costs to collaboration make things harder. So we have to to appreciate what, what's, uh, what's immediate ab ab about, about the sharing, the discussion that we're seeing a lot with Twitter and so on. Um, I think the, I'm, I'm gonna pick up on the framing collaboration bit because um, the interesting thing I think about the Arduino community is that there was never an understanding, um, a clear understanding of how you should be documenting work. Uh, there was never, there was sort of, you know, an unknown or, or um, an understanding within the community that being open about the fact that you used it was a good thing. Uh, for many years it wasn't, so for many years students who would get prizes for stuff and for really interesting work uh, wouldn't mention that they were using it because to a certain extent to them and to a, a designer classically talking about your tools is not interesting. It's like talking about the fact that you've used a hammer and a uh, foam board, etc. It's, it's not about the tools that you're using, it's about the process. And now I think that's starting to change because they see that as a badge that you kind of wear as a designer to be able to say, Actually, you know, I've made a decision to use an open source tool that others can use from, and then that invites a conversation with other members of the community as to, oh, so how did you build that? Um, and there's still a lot of people, and especially web developers or anybody who's got any online experience, will post up the code that they've used for a particular project. A lot of them don't necessarily, but. Uh, more and more they're kind of eager to share that they uh, have been using the platform. And eventually, I don't know whether that turns into kind of, you know, the GitHub of hardware and software, which is a whole world in itself because suddenly it's not only code, it's images, it's video, it's sets of instructions, it's a uh, bill of materials, when the, the, the term that's uh, in the industry. And I don't know whether the formalization of that will kill it, if you see what I mean. Um, and I'm kind of curious to see how it goes, but right now there are um, at least 150,000 Arduinos out there. Um, so if even half of them have actually posted up a blog post saying, I've used it, that's, you know, it's quite good, I think. Um, yeah. There's one comment from the audience. Thanks. Um, so there's a couple. Um, Arduinos, the uh, BBC's just done some stuff with Arduinos, so we, we found it really useful. Um, I'm interested in the whole open source design, and 
it's sort of missed in the Apple Google thing and the pay. This is something going on with the apps approach. And it took me back when you were doing about yours was written in HTML. Was there was always the pro the issue that you could just publish source. You could always view source the first time round. And it feels like that was actually very liberating and probably kickstarted a hell of a lot of careers because we could all see what everybody else had done and we hacked with others. And the Arduino s takes us back into that in hardware, which in effect I'm interested in the long term impact on industry, people, careers, you know, how we create sustained rather than ultra niche. And I just wonder whether the apps is actually the real hidden agenda problem because no one publishes their code from an app. It's all potential commission. No, no one. Uh, There's one in the room. Today. Which one? Um, yeah, so, so some people do publish their the, the uh, iPhone app code, um, but that's definitely not the norm. Um, it's important to, for me, you, you raised the point of, uh, of the fact that I used HTML for my presentation. It wasn't only because I was trying to make a point and I, and I started using it for a different presentation that was not about open source design and I didn't need to make that point there. I started to use it because I needed to collaborate with my partners on the presentation. And it's really, really hard to do that when you're doing a, a keynote or a, or a PowerPoint or, or anything like that. It's just not bo uh, made for that. And then we found that platform that was really ugly um, design-wise, uh, but, but as, as soon as we've seen it's HTML and CSS, we can do whatever we want with it, and I did whatever I wanted with it, and I can do much more. I can embed video and everything. Um, and, uh, but, but, um, but to your point about, uh, about the App Store, I think the App Store approach is very dangerous. To, to the kind of collaboration that, and the kind of innovation around openness that we're looking for be, because it creates this, this bottleneck of control. Um, it's, again, on the other hand, it's plausible for the users because they want to know that Apple has confirm, confirmed that. They, people want to be ruled. People want to be ruled, and you have to, to, you have to provide um, a, a inspiring open leadership if you want to really negate that. You have to understand that, that, that uh, anarchy, as, as inspiring as it is, it, it, it is a very complicated way of li living your life. Um, this could be a very culturally specific notion. Uh, I think it's time to take this discussion to the bar because it is kind of lunchtime. I would like to thank the panel a lot and the audience. Yeah.